before I forget. Um, so yeah, let there be art, seven days of creation. And I, I just also want to mention that Lisa helped me come up with the name. I wasn't sure what to call this big program. And so thank you for that as well. And helping me think so many things through with all this. Um, but with that said, I'm going to, so Stephen, Stephen is another wonderful person. I've had the, you know, great honor to connect with. Um, and I made that connection through Jason Kaplan. Um, a couple months ago, well, more than a couple months ago, we, we've been doing this virtual Jewish travel program. And I met Jason when I wanted to do a program on um, Memphis and the music scene, because music defines Memphis in so many ways. And um, I was talking to a Jewish organization. They're like, if you want to talk to somebody about music, Jew Jewish music, any music, Jason Kaplan's your person. And um, before this art program happened, I said, Jason, I'd love to bring in an artist from Memphis to participate in this. He goes, I know your person, Stephen. So um, he connected me to Stephen, and it's been such an honor and a joy. And I felt it would just be very appropriate to have Jason introduce him. So Jason Kaplan is an entrepreneur and musician. He is dedicated to music as a universal language to build bridges to people of all backgrounds. He built two nonprofit companies on this concept, the Bridge Institute and Beit Abulafia. Did I say that correct? Abulafia, you got it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay. He also formed the multi-faith band Nakshon's Leap, which is now recording and performing live in Memphis. Jason is a financial advisor for nonprofit hospitals and universities throughout TIAA. Jason and his wife, Michal, live in Memphis, Tennessee with their daughters, Ariella and Devorah. And I know that they play together um, in a band. So, and he'll tell you more about that. So it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Jason Kaplan. Great, thank you, Leah, and it's my honor to be here and to do a second program with you. Um, I've just so enjoyed getting to know you and meet you over this time. I hope I'm coming in, I'm not breaking up, everything looks okay? Okay, good. So, um, Memphis program, when we did it, and uh, I want to introduce my friend, Stephen Wachtel. I am I breaking up a little bit, Leah? We can hear your voice consistently but the image is a little, but that's. Okay, give me one moment. I'm gonna talk and I'm just gonna go bring this over to my other room, which is closer to the internet. Working from home, you know, we had this right in dress rehearsal. Can't believe this, so embarrassed. Excuse me. All good. Okay, excuse me, everybody. I just need you to be a little bit quiet out here, okay? All right, I'm back. And I'm gonna go this way. It's the day and age we live in. We've got dogs barking in the background, phones going off. Yeah. That happened to me yesterday at the close of the program. But anyway. Thanks for everyone for your patience. I think this will be a lot better. Um, so I want to I want to introduce my friend, Stephen Wachtel. Um, I moved here five years ago. And on um, the third day I was here, I was introduced to Stephen. He said, oh, you play music. Why don't you come down to Midtown with me and play some gigs? So I, I played my gig on my third day in Memphis when I moved here. Um, he's a wonderful person. Uh, and I think you're really... <laughs> uh -oh. All right. Well, give it one more second, and if not, well, while he's pausing, Stephen, why don't we go ahead and ask? You got cut off for a second again. It's terrible. I should use my phone. Okay, try again. And um, so he was, um, did I get to jet instructor pilot? No. Okay, jet instructor pilot, recognized internationally for work in reproductive genetics, lectured in the Mayo Clinic, Harvard University, University of London, and academic centers worldwide, authored more than 200 scientific articles, plays jazz regularly in Memphis, Clearwater, Florida, um, has his art, and um, I have this picture here. I wanted to show you the other one, but I'll show you this one. I have two Stephen Wachtels in my house. This is of Venice. And in the other room, which I was trying to show you, was of the uh, guitar player. Um, so he also plays brilliant saxophone, and um, Leah mentioned my group, Nakshon's Leap, uh, which is a multi-faith band. He plays saxophone in that group. 
Um, and I just want to say that he's just a wonderful friend. He reads Torah beautifully in synagogue. He blows the shofar uh, in a way that my wife says when she thinks of Mashiach coming, she'll hear Stephen Wachtel blowing the shofar to announce him coming. And, and she really means that with 100% sincerity. So I want to introduce my friend, Stephen. I'm sorry for my technical issues. Um, I hope I see everybody in person and we can never use the word Zoom again. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Stephen Wachtel. Wonderful. Okay. So great to have you, Jason. All right. yeah, do you want to play that uh, that little tape, or do you want me to do that? If you could do that, that would be great. Okay, so I'm going to hit share screen. Can I? Can you share my screen, please? Allow me to share my screen. Yes. Here we go. Okay, and then I'm going to play a little. Okay. Can you all see that? So Not showing. So that is a, a little snippet from a gig that I played in Dunedin, Florida in 2019 at the annual Dunedin Fish and Music Festival. And uh, I'm going to talk about the relationship between music and art, and in particular, how uh, inspiration and improvisation play a role in each. Are you all with me? Yes. Okay, good. So, what you heard was a group of people who had never played together before. That band was made up of a few people who knew each other and played with, with each other, but all together, that band was playing for the first time as a band. And the music that they're playing is totally improvised, which means it was made up on the spot as we went along. So how could it be so good as it was? I think it was pretty good. What made it good was the fact that we were playing within a matrix, within a format based on a chord progression. And everybody knows that chord, chord progression. And so they're able to proceed along the lines that result in a reasonable sound. I'm going to show how that happens in, in, in painting as well. So I'm gonna talk about inspiration, which is an idea or an experience something inside you that compels action, compels you to do something, play music or to, to paint a picture. And improvisation is defined as creation without preparation. But in, in terms of musical improvisation, we remember that there's a background, there's a, there's a matrix against which we're, we're building, okay? And I'll do that with a little slideshow here, if you'll allow me. Okay, hold on, if I can get this. Okay. I'm going to discuss four paintings of mine. The first one is based on a work by Paul Cezanne called The Card Players. So this is the inspiration and the improvisation involves a few little sketches improvised quickly thrown on a piece of paper. And then the next sketch was actually for Hasidim. I thought, wouldn't this be cool if I drew a Cubist rendition of four Hasidim playing cards, but decided in the end to paint a large picture with basically a Cubist format based on the Cezanne. So here we see inspiration, the Cezanne, and the improvisation based on a, on a matrix, which is the Cezanne painting. Okay, that's number one. Number two. Oh, I wanted to point out. Sorry, no, it's not me. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next one. This is a painting by Frida Kahlo. Uh, showing herself on the right and her husband, Diego Rivera, on the left. Frida was a surrealist who lived in Mexico. Interestingly, she had a Jewish father, 
uh, though I doubt that she had much to do with the Jewish religion. Diego Rivera was a, a, a world-class muralist. He painted huge murals. And she and her husband, both famous artists, were revolutionaries. They were communists. In fact, uh, when Leon Trotsky came to Mexico, he stayed with them. And there are rumors that the friendship between Frida and Leon Trotsky went beyond a normal friendship, but that's another story. At any rate, um, they made a movie about Frida. She, she lived a tragic life. She suffered a, a very serious injury as a young woman, but despite her injury, she was able to, to produce great art. Uh, and the movie was called Frida. And in that movie, there was a song called Vivan Los Sueños, music again, music and art. So on the basis of that song, I produced a little sketch and you can see the beginnings of some Mexican ideas in there. Uh, and here's, here's the intermediate stage and here's the final product. It's called Vivan Los Sueños, same title as the song from the movie Frida. You can see there's a guitar player, got a serape and uh, a woman dancing, uh, a piano, uh, keyboard. On the right side, can you see the, 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 what looks like the number 25 or is that obscured? Yeah. So actually what that is, that's taken from a painting by Diego Rivera. You see the little number 25 on the left, that is a part of a serape next to a rifle. And the name of this painting was Zapatista Landscape. Uh, Diego Rivera was paying homage to uh, Zapata, who was another revolutionary. He was assassinated uh, in 1920. Okay, so much for that one. And the next one, uh, I, I got away from the Cubist idea. I went, this is a friend of our family, Milton Landers, who's sitting, sitting in our kitchen. And when I saw that hat, I was inspired. I said, I've got to, I've got to do something about that hat. Uh, but there's a problem, you know, the background, all the kitchen utensils, that crazy shirt he's wearing, the, 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 uh, the spectacles hanging around his neck. So what I did was threw a sketch on paper. This is the improvisational part of that, of that process. And then began to paint, began to, to fill in the colors. And at the end, we ended up with a painting that looked like this. This is one of my favorite uh, subjects, Mr. Landers. And this is the final product. Uh, a painting, a portrait, classical kind of portrait, but that hat is what started the whole thing. And then lastly, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, a couple who now live in Toronto, Canada, asked me to, they commissioned me to paint uh, Jerusalem. And they specifically requested uh, Jerusalem in the Cubist style that I like to do. And the final product here, you, you can see, I, I have a son who lives in Jerusalem, or out, well, he did live in Jerusalem, now he lives in Ramat Beit Shemesh outside of Jerusalem. And um, so we've been there many, many, many times. I don't know how many, probably close to 100 or more. And uh, this city is very close to all our hearts, I'm sure. You can see the various sites which characterize Jerusalem on the left, the, the Migdal David, the Tower of David on the right, the Monte Pior windmill, uh, the, the little arc in the middle, the arch, is um, the remnants of the Ramban synagogue, which has now been fully restored. Under that, there is a, a section which is based on the Kotel, the, the western wall of the temple. You can see the, uh, the ramparts of the old city. Lower right, there's a little, looks like a chassid grandfather leading his, his grandson somewhere. That started out as a, as a black smear but I remembered the words of, of Bob Ross, who, who said, uh, there is no such thing as, as a mistake in painting, only happy accidents. So I said, what could this be? And it turned out it was a little man leaving his grandson. So we've talked about four of my paintings, how they uh, involve inspiration and improvisation. Um, one of them was called The Card Players, Vivan Los Sueños was the second, Mr. Landers, The Classical Portrait in Jerusalem. And uh, we've seen again how inspiration and, and improvisation play central roles in, I'm trying to get rid of this screen, in, uh, and get myself back here. Oh, there I am. Uh, uh, play central roles in both music and in art. Uh, I want to thank Leah for inviting me to participate in this wonderful 
wonderful program. I want to thank Jason for introducing me to Leah and for his introduction. I want to thank you all for zooming in. And uh, I have some other paintings which I can show you, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. Uh, Shabbat Shalom Lachem. Uh, good Shabbos to all of you. And I hope we see each other in person one of these days. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. Your work is unbelievable. And uh, it was wonderful working with you, uploading all your images and just seeing your work. I mean, yeah, we, we could extend this whole class together to, and what is that piece? That's my wife, Gwen. Oh, lovely. Beautiful. An older piece. I have lots of stuff, but I'll, I'll show you one more and then we call it a day. This is one I just finished, which I'm very proud of. It's uh, an actress named Maud Adams. Beautiful. From an old movie. So much for the paintings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And now we are very honored to have Rabbi Jonathan Case from Beth Shalom in Columbia, South Carolina, who will be introducing Lisa Harvey, another one of our artists. So I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce you to Rabbi Case. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here and introduce um, one of my favorite people who has a soul that reaches out beyond, well beyond her body. So some basic background, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the artwork before Lisa talks about it more specifically. Lisa Harvey is a teacher, therapist, and artist. She's the owner of the Art and Play Therapy Center in South Carolina. Her paintings have been shown in galleries in Columbia and Charleston. Her powerful work in watercolor, acrylic, and mixed media portray bold, soulful abstracts. In creating art, Lisa Harvey looks for balance and beauty, and she finds them. She sees this as a priority in her own life as a therapist. Lisa spends many hours with individuals encouraging them to listen to their own emotional, spiritual, and physical needs and set priorities for themselves based on this. She believes we find strength and develop a sense of well-being by having balance and beauty in life. Lisa Harvey believes in making art as a joyful and spiritual process. Her work as a therapist and teacher over the years has paralleled her work as an artist. She's won awards for her watercolors, clay sculpture, and photography. She presently shows her work in galleries in Columbia, Charleston, as signature member of the South Carolina Watercolor Media, Media Society. And now from my heart, um, on the very first day of creation, God says, you heat or let there be light. And there's no source of light. God simply says, let there be light. And it's the supernal light that suffuses the universe in something that is ineffable, something that we feel if we open up our soul, our heart, to something that we can only see with our heart, not with our eyes. And we realize that in our dimension as we celebrate the Sabbath that comes in just a few hours from now, as we kindle the Shabbat lights, the Sabbath lights that augurating the holy day, and imitating God by recreating light when there was nothing is nothing but darkness. This is what Lisa Harvey's work essentially does. She talks about spirituality. She lives the life of a spiritual being, and she's looking for the spiritual dimension that inheres in every moment of a life. And so when she talks about light and she talks about the Shabbat candles, she's talking about the supernal light, the light that she sees because she has eyes that witness, eyes that are able to see. And as you look at her artwork and she talks about it, I hope you can feel the power that is behind not only the artwork and the words, but lies deep within the soul of this woman. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Lisa Harvey. Thank you, Rabbi. So I asked a rabbi if he would introduce me because probably he understands the process that I um, come to um, with bringing and merging my spirituality and my art. Um, it took me a while to call myself an artist. Um, 
I introduce myself and on my website, I call myself a teacher, a therapist, and then lastly, an artist. But you know, working with children that have cancer as an art therapist, I always used to say when I would do workshops and trainings that art lasts longer than we do. Our art is our legacy sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> it's our actions that are our legacy. So by encouraging myself to get to the paint and canvas in my, in my uh, middle, middle life, I'm so glad I did because um, I do feel like it's part of my legacy. Um, so here to a nice segue to this series that I wanna to talk to you about uh, called Keep and Remember. So my process of art is pretty simple that I have to carve out a time and if I have time, then I paint. It's my play. And so, and I don't usually am doing a million zillion things, um, but I have to carve time out to, 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 to paint. And I love painting. It really is my play. It is joy. I feel like it's a gift. So my series are called, um, are usually spiritual, have spiritual names, gratitude, freedom, essence, awe, swimming in the sea of awe, um, and um, Hamsa's, which is in thy hand is thy soul. So in that way, I feel like I connect with, I guess what I'm looking for, for me to become a bigger or better person. And if I can share that with somebody else, then maybe we'll all learn a little something. You don't, I don't have to speak to do that. I think that the painted word, um, as David Moss showed us yesterday, um, says much more than really my voice right now. Believe you me, as a therapist and the oldest of five children and a talker, I pray to God every morning to help me listen better and not just and to become a better listener. But I want to share with you a little bit about Keep and Remember. And it's Shamar Ve Zahar, which uh, I guess that, that, that's the, the literal translation. The rabbi is my um, connection to the Hebrew when I paint um, the spiritual, my, what I call my, my Judaica art spiritual series. Um, I think that what I wanted to do was connect something that I was taught or observed as a little girl that I wanted to pass it down. Stephen and Leah and I had a conversation about flow and, and improvisation as Stephen talked about and um, the creative power of art. Well, there is flow, but in the act of doing as in Judaism, in the act of playing, in the act of playing music and the act of, of painting, um, we really are inviting more light in, like, like lighting the Sabbath candles. So I say that we create and invite more light by lighting the Sabbath candles. Um, Rabbi spoke to that uh, in the first uh, paragraph of, in Genesis. We read that there was light created before darkness. And in, to me, lighting the Sabbath candles is such an intimate and holy act. It signifies light and joy and being aware of good and hope in each and every week. And by lighting the Sabbath candles, we create and invite more light into our homes and into our life. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit later about the act of lighting the candles. But I wanna, um, I wanna show you a, a couple of pictures. And Leah, thank you so much for A, organizing this. I have new art friends from all over the United States. You have created this community that I think, I don't think this is the end of this. I think we're gonna see a lot more of this. Don't you, Stephen? 
I hope so. I don't. I don't. Don't know if any of the other artists are watching from um, to this week, but this has been wonderful. And she's kind of held my hand through this process, getting me on the get on the gallery and putting my pictures up. So, Leah, if you will show that very first picture of me, no, the other one, the sofa picture, the sofa picture. Okay, so. <laughs> I was taught to light candles. That is me on my mother's lap. That is my grandmother. And that is my great-grandmother, my booby and my grandmother. They're from Charleston, South Carolina. I'm a Southern girl. And so were my parents. So were my parents. They're both from uh, Columbia and Charleston. And my grandmother's from Charleston. So my lineage is, is Southern Jewish. And um, there's actually almost too much light in here. It's very bright because of the Southern sun. Um, my grandmother was brought up, was Orthodox and very observant. And my, gran my grandmother, maybe not so, not as much. And then if you'll show the next picture, that's a four generation picture. And then here is me with my daughter, my firstborn, my booby, aging my mother and my grandmother in the back. And um, then the very next picture, the color picture is me. I'm getting a little flaclimped. <laughs> Hold on. Me, my mother, my daughter and my grandson first granddaughter. So what I have found is that a tradition to be kept alive is only when we add something to it. So I wanted to share all these wonderful this traditions and all these feminine maternal being added to. But we as women have to um, share something and we share a lot, but we, one thing that I really want to share and every night, every Friday, I light the Sabbath candles and I ask my daughters to call me and I ask my grandchildren to wish, to call or wish me good Shabbos. So sometimes um, we do that via Zoom this year. Sometimes I invite them over. Sometimes I call and I'm doing it on the phone. So um, Leah, if you want to show the first, just one of the Keep and Remember series. I hope that my granddaughter will keep and remember this tradition. And um, what I have found that, but the act of lighting candles, that it, that it imitates God. And I'm gonna turn off my phone. I'm sorry. What, what I have found in the act of lighting the candles that it imitates God by creating light. It brings more light into your life and to my life. And it also helps me be able to shine my light out to you. By lighting the Sabbath candles, it imitates that. That when we light the Sabbath candles, we bring our light into our lives and we shine it out. We bring in the blessings of the Sabbath. And honestly, lighting the candles is an authentic and an intentional act of love. There is a flow. You could show the next, next one. You could show a couple of these, Leah. There is a flow involved. So there is the creative power of art and painting, but in the rituals, I think of Judaism, there is a beautiful flow and a beautiful connection. And honestly, it's a collective unconscious that connects me to all the generations before me and all the generations after me. And it makes me really feel, you know, connected to everything. Um, so basically, you know, um, one of the acts of lighting the candles is a ritual remembered by, that I hope, that will be remembered by your children's children. 
to show another one. And I guess finally, like I said about the collective unconscious, when we, the act of lighting the Shabbos candles, we connect with the universal light of the Sabbath and we uh, continue, continue to kindle the lights of Zion. And to me, that is very powerful. And I am a Zionist and I feel um, that, that, that by my lighting the candles and all of us in that act bring forth continued life to Israel and the people of Israel. You can show more. So my spiritual work is really different than my, um, um, my which, spiritual which, which image would you like me to share at this point? Any of the, any of the keep and remember series. All right. So, yeah. So I, um, I, my spiritual work is a little different than my other work. I'm a Southern girl and I'm surrounded by water and sunshine and lots of light. And so you'll, I'm doing a series right now that I'll share with you at the very um, end in a minute. Well, at the end. And, um, but the, the paintings keep and remember, I just wanted to focus on because it really signifies the color, the flow, the movement, the abstract, um, the collage and how I put work together. Um, most of these pieces are sold. There are three pieces on my gallery now in the Let There Be Art that is still for sale. So check it out. Um, actually, maybe two. Um, and I'm going to be painting more of these because they were very popular and I love painting them. Behind me, I love the shape of candlesticks. I, uh, one of them mimics um, these, all the candlesticks that I own. I just adore the shape and ha um, how they, um, I don't know, I like the, the, the rhythm and the balance uh, against the background of the light. So um, you could show more. Those are the only ones I have from that series, but I have your other ones. Okay, no, that's okay. Um, I sent a couple, but that's that's okay. So listen, show one of my, keep um, just the one, or maybe show the one you have. So what I want to do is just show you the difference of when I paint, what I, when I look out versus when I look in. From, if that does that make sense? So if you'll show one of the key uh, fifty shades of blue, absolutely, you got it. Yeah. No. So when I look out, it's simple. It feels simple. <laughs> I just paint sky and water. That's it. Sky, water. It's easy as that, and lots of different forms. But when I look in. It becomes more colorful. It becomes uh, a little bit more complicated. So it's a re it's real different, isn't it? And it's almost like there's two of me. Um, there's that artist, and then there's that artist. And I don't I don't know if Stephen feels that sometimes his work seems to flow. Um, there's no division, but. There is a division for me with my secular art and my spiritual art, even though, and this is my last thing I think I'll say, because I think it's getting time to, for Q and A, is that um, it all feels spiritual. I'm by myself. I'm not with anybody else. I'm with the paint. I'm with colors. I'm with shapes. I'm with brushes. <laughs> And it's just me and whatever comes out of me, whatever I create. And that is pretty powerful for me. Um, I had to learn to accept that. I had to learn, that's from my Nishama series. I had to learn to accept whatever I created was good. I'm not perfect, but I had to accept that, um, that, 
I had to accept that it was okay. You know, even if um, you might not like it, if I like it, it's going out there. And so what I have found is if I'm authentic and if I'm real and in my expression and putting things down on paper and in clay um, and the way I connect with community, with my art, then most people actually have liked it. And it still surprises me to this day. But um, anyway, I just wanna thank y'all for letting me share. If, Leah, if you'll just close with a keep and remember. It is almost near Shabbos. Um, we're closing in, it's late Shabbos tonight in the South. Probably won't be sunset to about, um, what Rabbi? Um, nine o'clock, eight o'clock, 8.30. About 8.20. 8.20. So it, Shabbos is about 8.20 tonight and I wish all of you a uh, good Shabbos. And um, I challenge you, if you haven't done it, to either watch somebody light the candles, like I watched my grandmothers and my mother and my great grandmother, and hopefully my daughters um, from here on, you know, will, will watch me and I'll watch them. Anyway, I challenge you to, to light a candle, a Sabbath candle tonight and connect with someone.